Remember around the holidays when thousands of Southwest flights were canceled and customers were sleeping in airports? Uh, we've been waiting for at least two days. And screaming at attendants? I want a refund. I've been in the and line since like 10 a.m. I've been at the airport since 4 a.m. Or what about the late shift Waffle House waitress that caught a chair in midair? Oh! I've been watching hundreds of these kinds of videos and it makes me wonder, how exactly do these fights happen? We all know it's certainly not the workers' fault. But in a lot of cases, it's not the customer either. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you spent 25 minutes on the phone with your bank to dispute a credit card fee? Everywhere you go, a worker is being replaced with a QR code. I've come to a conclusion. We're right to be angry, but we're wrong about who we're angry at. We're actually mad at the CEOs and executives of these companies, but the problem is we can't access them. They've barricaded themselves away from our reach, so we take out our aggression on the working class people we should be having solidarity with. And this is all by design. In this video, we'll talk about three different ways that corporations have made life hell for both customers and their workers. Rating and reviewing systems, automation, and deliberate understaffing. Big businesses use these things as tools to cut costs and also to shift our anger to the wrong people, all while protecting profits and the status quo. This is The Classroom for More Perfect Union, and today we're going to be talking about the real reason customer service sucks. We were inspired to make this video because we read an article from Adam Johnson. You might know him from his podcast, Citations Needed. First, let's talk about what Adam calls the snitch economy. So we use the term snitch economy because basically it turns the consumer into uh, a free manager, basically. Companies are constantly worried about how their workers, quote unquote, steal time from them. Like slack off, right? You got time to lean, you got time to clean. We've, we've all heard this. Well, I know we look slow and I know it looks clean, but it's not, there's a lot of different things for you guys to be doing right now. And so what they do is they build in mechanisms to the economics of their system that basically turn the consumer into a snitch, into a manager. Customers are now provided with more and more apps and websites and surveys that allow you to rate and review workers. This is supposed to be empowering for customers, but what it really does is make you do management's job for them. Every time you choose to give an Uber driver a certain amount of stars or rate the service of a Grubhub delivery, you're effectively doing the management's job for them. You're spying on workers on behalf of the company. You are deputized as a mini boss, a manager. We talked to Megan who worked at call centers for eight years, first at Bank of America and then at a large insurance company. We asked her how many customers would call in already pissed. Oh, it was a daily occurrence. It was probably at least like 10 times a day. <laughs> and you would have people like verbally abusing you every single day, like for things that were completely out of your control. And sometimes you could understand like where they were coming from, but being the one on the other end of those corporate decisions getting screamed at is just very stressful. Megan worked 10 hour shifts with just three short breaks and the calls would come all day long. Management would always be like, try to go to the bathroom on your breaks. Like the human body doesn't unfortunately work around breaks. She was subject to monthly reviews from her manager who reviewed her calls not just based on customer satisfaction, but also the length and the efficiency of the call. So Megan not only had to be polite and friendly, but also had to get the customer off the phone in five minutes or less. This connects to our second example, automation. Speak to a representative. Speak to a representative. One moment while I get someone from customer service to help. Thank you. These days, even getting to the bottom rung employee at a company is difficult. How may I help you? So if you have a problem, it's increasingly hard to talk to an actual human about it. Don't go to the register. Instead, go to the app and order. Scan the QR code. Don't wait on hold. Instead, go to a random website that may or may not answer your question. More and more consumers are being pushed away from actual humans and onto automated services that we're told will save us time but they're actually to save big businesses in labor costs. Customers don't like dealing with automated prompts and cost cutting is turning them against the companies. Just look at this article from management consulting sharks, McKinsey and company companies, they say face a perfect storm of increasing call volumes, talent shortages and rising customer expectations. Talent shortages, they say. Maybe it's because the average call center worker only earns $34,000 a year. Customer satisfaction is at a 17 year low. And the only human face that people will take their aggression out on is the low wage worker. Corporate executives very much want you to take your aggression out on their low wage workers. This way you get a vague feeling of agency and control in a system that is designed to keep you very far from it. Now we're gonna talk about deliberate understaffing. 
As a lot of you may know, the last two years have been a watershed moment in labor organizing. And American approval of labor unions is the highest it's been since 1965. It's very convenient then that just as workers are beginning to get leverage, companies are using every tool at their disposal to gut staffing to its bare bones. These last few years, companies have blamed staff shortages on labor shortages. No one wants to work anymore. But businesses are now seeing this as an opportunity to automate or cut costs. Over the long term, you know, we're trying to make bold choices about technology, not to replace our workers, but to make them more productive because we're assuming we'll have fewer workers going forward. Restaurants like IHOP, Applebee's, and Popeye's are running with 10 to 12% smaller staffs than before the pandemic, and they're still trying to find ways to double up on workers' duties. In a recent earnings call, the CEO of Chili's proposed removing an hour of prep time each day by not rationing and packaging shrimp for each dish. Labor, he reasoned, is now more expensive than an extra shrimp in the fettuccine. Why don't we get rid of that and save millions of dollars uh, in terms of labor that can either be redeployed back into the restaurant or potentially to the bottom line if we can change, you know, the amount of hours that we deploy to the, to the business. Let's go back to the Waffle House waitress. Her name is Haley. You touch my floor, it's on. Oh, no! The night of that fight, Haley was the only cook serving 30 to 40 people in that restaurant. The place was badly understaffed, and that's not uncommon. Chronic understaffing is exactly why we see those feel-good videos of workers staffing restaurants by themselves or manning multiple grills at once or even customers coming in and cleaning and cooking at the Waffle House. After the fight, Waffle House said that she handled the customer appropriately, but still decided to write her up. And for what? Breaking a sugar shaker. About six months later, when I went to apply at another Waffle House in North Carolina, I had found out that I was blacklisted and on the do not hire list. Now, Waffle House might not be famous for its care for its workers. This is the place, after all, that FEMA uses as an unofficial indicator for how deadly a hurricane was. Several Waffle House employees actually live reported Hurricane Ian in Florida last year. Coming to you live from Waffle House right now, my name is Chelsea and I will be your weather forecast person. Do you think any of these employees got hazard pay or a bonus? No, absolutely not. Joe Rogers Jr., the chairman of Waffle House, became a billionaire during the pandemic while also working to cut pay to workers who worked through the early weeks of it. We're going to do our best to protect their income, and you have to save the business. All of this boils down to increasing profits and shielding the real wrongdoer. These companies are trying to get away with anything they can, because they're betting that you're only going to get mad at the person behind the counter or on the phone. The people who actually make decisions are guarded through layers of bureaucratic red tape and lawyers, impossible to reach by design. The truth is, we all have a lot more in common with each other than we do with billionaires who are trying to keep us mad at one another. Instead of being mad at low-wage workers, we need to have solidarity with them. You're not in competition with each other. Repeat, you are not in competition with each other. Let's redirect our anger to the people in charge instead. But we want to know what you think. Have you ever worked customer service and had to deal with a mob of angry customers for minimum wage? Or have you ever been ripped off by your insurance company because they keep redirecting you to a robot instead of helping fix the problem that they created? Let us hear your customer service horror stories or let us know any other issues you want to see us cover. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to support more videos like this one.